All right. We are at two o'clock, so I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Veronica Reynolds, Head of Community Relations at New City Library. And once a quarter, I give a talk myself, although usually I have outside speakers coming in to join us. And I've been doing talks on famous writers. And if you are curious, most of them are recorded and available on our website. I have one on Jane Austen, which was from last month. In March, we had done Oscar Wilde. And in February, we did Alexander Dumas. And we've even done The Bard himself, Shakespeare and Chaucer. So all of those are available on our YouTube channel, New City Library's YouTube channel, which you can find with just that as a Google search. But today we're going to be talking about Virginia Woolf. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that uh, Woolf's life was troubled, and we will be talking about mental illness, anti-Semitism, childhood sexual abuse, and some other sensitive topics. So please just be aware of that as we get underway. Those are all things that affected her life and that she may have had sentiments about, and we will be touching on all of them. So just to give you a time and place, Virginia Woolf was born and came of age in Victorian England, and it was a time of a lot of change, both politically and culturally. The Industrial Revolution was underway, the way that Parliament was run was changing, and you had all of these stifling society rules. But as she got a little older and into adulthood, we moved into the Edwardian period, and some of those restrictions were starting to loosen. But even with that loosening, a woman's role was very clearly defined and did not generally include intellectual pursuits. And that is a very large overarching theme in Wolf's work. So let's talk about her roots. We'll start with her mother, Julia Princep Stephen Nay Jackson. She was born in 1846 in India. Um, she was from what they called an Anglo-Indian family, meaning she was part of a family that had from England gone to India um, and been there for some time. Uh, but by the time she was a small child, they had come back to England. So she grew up in England. She had an aunt who was actually a fairly well-known photographer. You'll notice there's going to be a theme of famous relations around Virginia Woolf. So her mother was photographed very frequent, frequently by this aunt. So that's one of the photos there to the right. That is Julia Princep Stephen. Thanks to a different well-connected aunt, um, she also became involved in the artistic scene of the time. In 1867, she marries her first husband, who is a barrister. She has three children with him before he passes away. She grieves him very deeply, and part of the way that she makes ends meet and buries her grief is that she becomes a nurse. During this time period, again, she is still rotating through the art scene, and that's how she meets Leslie Stevens. They start writing each other letters, and they eventually do get married, and they have four more children together, including Virginia. Julia wrote children's stories, and she was a big crusader for women's rights, but within the confines of what she understood to be women's rights. She did not believe in women getting the vote. She felt that men and women had very separate spheres of influence, and they shouldn't have anything to do with each other. So she was forward-thinking, but with very strong limitations. Virginia Woolf's father, Leslie Stevens, was born in 1832 into a well-known intellectual family, but religious, and they were part of a Christian sect that centered on social reform, including abolition. He attended Trinity College, and he begins a career there um, and obtains his degree, becomes ordained. But while he's at school, Darwin's very famous book is published, and between that and a lot of other things that he discovers in the course of his education, he loses his faith. So he never... Um, acts as a religious figure. Instead, he resigns and he moves to London in 1864. He starts the second career, arguably never really started the first one, but he has a second career as a journalist where he's quite success successful and he mixes with a lot of the big literary names of the time, just like his children eventually will. His first wife is a woman who's known as Minnie, but her legal name is Harriet Thackeray. He loved her very much by all accounts. They did have one child together and they lost two children before Minnie passes away. He begins that correspondence with Julia. They're married three years after his first wife's death. What he is actually the most known for is mountaineering. So this was also the age of exploration. Climbing mountains was a very big pastime for men with a little bit of money. And he wrote a book on the subject that was a classic for many, many years 
after he even passed away. Virginia had a lot of siblings, and they're all very important to her story. Um, for the, yeah, I would say all of them. So she had her half, three half siblings. Um, her children from the first marriage were George, Stella, and, jo and Gerald. They're all significantly older than Virginia, so they would come of age and be adults while she was still a child, which matters in her story. George um, becomes this public servant. He marries and has children. Gerald becomes a publisher of a pretty well-known imprint. He marries but has no children. Stella tragically dies shortly after her own marriage at 28, but we'll talk more about all three of them as we go forward. And now, the only one that disappears is her half-sister, which was Leslie and Minnie's daughter. Laura was labeled slow and eventually showed signs of mental disturbance. Essentially, what modern researchers think is that she was suffering from some kind of psychosis, uh, but they institutionalized her and she spends the rest of her life in an asylum. So Virginia would only know her for a very short time and likely never saw her again. Now, Virginia has three full siblings from the marriage of Leslie and Julia. Vanessa, who eventually grows up to be Vanessa Bell, who was a notable artist, and we'll visit with Vanessa more extensively later. Phoebe, who I had to spell check and correct many times, but he is Phoebe, not Toby. Um, they had a lot of expectations for Phoebe, but he unfortunately passes at 26 from typhus. We'll visit with Phoebe again later as well. And then we have Adrian, who does not come up extensively again later, but he is one of Britain's first psychoanalysts. And I just wanted to touch on him briefly because we're only going to mention him in passing as we go through this. But he married, had children. He was a conscientious objector during World War I to the point where he was sent to work on a farm to support the war efforts because he refused to go fight. But he actually recanted that status when he heard about the horrors of the Nazis and voluntarily joined the war effort as a psychoanalyst in his 50s. So he had a big turnaround. I do see your question, Jeff, and I have to look it up, so I'm, I'll touch back on it later. So let's talk about Virginia's early life. That picture on the side is baby Virginia Woolf with her mother, Julia. She was born in 1882. The Stevens are living at 22 Hyde Park in South Kensington, Virginia. I'm sorry, sorry in South Kensington. Uh, and they would stay there for probably it's one of the longest residences of Virginia's life because she would stay there during um, the cooler months, they would be there until her father's death in 1904. Um, they did do a huge renovation on the house, though, because there was a lot of kids, a lot of people living in that house, and it was very small and very narrow. As a small girl, Virginia is already very literary. Her two older siblings start a newsletter called Hyde Park Gate News, which was about little household goings on. It had articles and photographs and pictures. And while it was originally her older sibling's um, passion project, she winds up writing most of the articles for this little newspaper. Now, much like most girls at this time, she does not receive a formal education. She's educated at home by her mother, who is fairly educated herself. Again, this is just kind of knowledge passed down without formal schooling, but it was helpful. But unlike other girls, she was allowed full access to her father's library, which was extensive. So this is a quote from Virginia herself about that. Even today, she was writing this in the 1920s, there may be parents who would doubt the wisdom of allowing a girl of 15 the free run of a large and quite unexpected library. But my father allowed it. There were certain facts, very briefly, very shyly, he referred to them. Yet, read what you like, he said, and all his books were to be had without asking. So she did have access to this really extensive library and educated from that. The first, maybe not first, but the first known big tragedy. Oh, I... <laughs> That noise is unfortunately coming from my office. Everybody else is muted. Let me change my audio settings to be a little bit more robust. All right, hopefully that'll filter out more of the background sound, but I apologize. I'm also going to close my door a little bit more firmly. <laughs> but I am, I am at the library, so sometimes the background sound does come through. I apologize for that. Everyone else is muted. That's my fault. All right, hopefully that's a little bit better. So at 13, Virginia's mother passes away, which, as you can imagine, was quite the change in the household. So this causes a huge um, cascade of events. Julia falls ill with influenza in February 1895. She never really recovers. It does take her a couple of months to pass away. 
Stella Duckworth, who is the oldest of the half siblings, of female half siblings, she was traveling at the time. She rushes back because it's her responsibility to take over as mother, essentially. She becomes the family matriarch. Um, you have to be a very rowdy librarian here, you're correct. Um, but as soon as Stella comes back, she does meet the man that she ultimately marries. And of course, she has to leave and join her own household. And Vanessa, who's only 18, has to take over caring for her younger siblings. So that's already hard enough for a young woman of only 18. But Virginia has what she refers to as her first nervous breakdown. So the language around mental illness at this time was not necessarily helpful to interpreting modern issue, modern thought on mental illness, but it sounds like she was quite depressive um, and very upset and inconsolable and ill. So Vanessa is trying to help Virginia with that. We'll talk more about that episode in a bit. At this time, George is old enough, where he's one of the half brothers, that he wants to like give the girls a debut, which would have been a very normal thing for people of their station, where they go out into society to be met. Neither of the girls respond well to it, and it begins a lifelong disaffection with societal norms and expectations around girls. Not long after this, really only two years after her mother dies, Virginia loses her half-sister, Stella, who remember did come home to take care of them all. She dies in 1897. And not too long after that, her father becomes ill. He has a surgery in 1902. It doesn't really work. He takes a long time to die, but he does pass away in 1904. Virginia would refer to those years as the seven unhappy years. I find it amazing she doesn't include her mother's death in that and make it the nine unhappy years, but maybe she was trying to condense her time. Her mother in particular left a really deep mark on Virginia. If asked who her favorite parent was, she used to say her sister, her mother rather, and she would talk about her extensively, but the older she got, the more she learned about her mother and the more her view of her mother would change. Julia had been extremely busy. She was taking care of her husband, who was um, not emotionally undemanding himself. It was a complicated relationship. And the only way Virginia found reliably to get her mother's attention was to be ill. So that probably didn't help the situation. And she would describe Stella, her older sister, when she was alive, as subservient to her mother's will. So she was catering to what her mother needed. So that took another potential care figure out of service a lot of the time. She had very ambivalent feelings about her father. She would describe him as a tyrant, like her sister Vanessa often did, but also as a great literary genius, which she hoped to inherit. So in a letter in 1940, she'd be in her 50s by then, she wrote, mother has haunted me, but then so did that old wretch, my father. I was more like him than her, I think, and therefore more critical. He was an adorable man and somehow tremendous. So you can see even in <laughs> a couple of sentences, a real changing feeling. Um, so he was definitely a complicated figure in her life. Now, I pulled up this video. I was debating on where to put it in the presentation. But I think Vanessa, um, who, remember, is 18 when she takes over caring for her sister, deserves a moment in the sun herself. Vanessa Bell that's her married name, was a pretty famous painter in her own right. So even though she, you'll often see her mentioned in the same breath as Virginia, she's also respected in on her own merits. So I just wanted to spend a little time with Vanessa where she's not in the shadow of her sister. This is a coverage of her home. You'll hear them mention the Bloomsbury Group, which we'll talk about pretty extensively in a little bit. Um, but also is just a, a quick break. Let's look at her home. Uh, come on. I'm so sorry. And we are at Charleston in East Sussex. Come. And we are at Charleston in East Sussex this morning, the former home of artists Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant. And today we're going to be exploring the life and work of Vanessa Bell. Vanessa Bell moved to Charleston from London in 1916, and she came with her lover Duncan Grant, as well as his lover David Garnett. Now, this was definitely an unconventional setup, but this place was a haven for experimentation. This was the time of liberation. And we see that in these incredible murals and every single inch of this house is coated in her paintwork. 
We are now in the iconic former studio of Vanessa Bell, a studio she shared with Duncan Grant until 1939. After that, she went up into the attic where she made a studio for herself, where she could look over the garden. Vanessa Bell felt liberated by the European modernists who she saw in the early 1900s, and she very much looked to the European modernists who became known as the post-impressionists, Gauguin, Van Gogh, Matisse. And that's what she did. She adopted their forms and their exploration of abstract shapes and applied it to her own. This was a time when art in Britain was still very academic and rigid, and the European modernists opened up a new language for the modern age. Vanessa Bell was groundbreaking. She was one of the first artists in Britain to work in a fully abstracted vein, and she really adopted from the European modernists. And we can see this in her use of unconventional and vivid colour, especially something I can see in this work, The Pond, which was, according to Duncan Grant, the first artwork she made at Charleston in 1916. But it was also of Charleston as well. So we really see her adaptation of using these vivid colours and also applying what she found and was inspired by from the European modernists. She also looked to her husband Clive Bell's theory of significant form, who believed that form, colour and composition should actually take precedent over the subject itself. We are now standing in the garden room, and in this room we see a very rare early example of Vanessa Bell's painting. Much of Vanessa Bell's early work has not survived. This was due to her studio being destroyed throughout the Second World War. But in this room we get a glimpse of what that early work was like. The work behind me is called Iceland Poppies from 1908, and it's such a beautiful example of Vanessa Bell's early work. It's such a subtle painting filled with whites and you see these very delicate poppies in the foreground of the painting. The work was hailed when it was first exhibited at the New English Art Club in London and this was also a revelation because so few women had ever had the chance to exhibit in this exhibition. Virginia Woolf, Vanessa Bell's sister, actually wrote that all her friends were so envious of her as well. And even the likes of Walter Sickert, who was a prominent member of the New English Art Club, praised and hailed this painting. And Vanessa Bell, she never saw herself as a woman artist. She never saw herself as other to her male counterparts. She was first and foremost an artist, and that's exactly what we see in this work. In this room, which is the former bedroom of Vanessa Bell, we can see so much of her personality and also how much her family meant to her through the sheer range and amount of portraits that she surrounded herself with. Here we see a portrait of her son Quentin, her son Julian, her daughter Angelica, not only did Vanessa Bell paint her children for sentimental reasons, but she was also intrigued by their form, how they moved, what they looked like as a baby. And we see this totally beautifully executed in this wonderful portrait of Julian as a baby from 1908, when she was on the cusp of really honing her modernist language. And in this work, it's almost as though we understand what it was like for him to breathe, what he sounded like, what he felt like. There is so much movement and tenderness in this portrait as well. Vanessa's son, Julian, was killed in the Spanish Civil War, which left her utterly devastated. Combined with her sister's suicide in 1941, Vanessa Bell withdrew in her later life, and she was described by her husband, Clive Bell, as sadder and more silent than ever. Vanessa Bell lived and worked at Charleston from 1916 to 1961, and during that time, together with Duncan Grant, transformed it into a complete work of art. They believed that art shouldn't just hang on the walls, but it should be brought to life. And that is exactly what we see here at Charleston, worlds away from the stuffy, closed Victorian interiors that she was brought up in. She brought art to life. She covered every single lampshade, every single doorknob tile in her iconic style that transformed British modernism forever. So yeah, I just wanted to get let Vanessa get her day because it's, I think, historically sometimes overshadowed at this point by her sister. But for a long time, she was the more famous relative. So just something to keep in mind. And she was very close to Virginia. They were close their entire lives. Um, Virginia doted on her nieces and nephews. She was very close with them as well. So from Hyde to Bloomsbury. After um, their father had died, Stephen sold Hyde Park and they moved to a more bohemian neighborhood known as Bloomsbury. For a time, it seemed like George would move with them, which they were very frightened of. Oh, because I skipped a slide. We'll get back to that. I'll 
talk about that momentarily. Um, we'll talk about why she was afraid that George would come with them. But luckily, he married just in time, and they were saved from that fate. Toby and Vanessa began social groups out of their home that grew into regular meetings of what would be known as the Bloomsbury Group or the Bloomsbury Set. And they were enormously influential. Um, the Bloomsbury Group spanned dozens of writers, artists, critics of the day. Some famous names you may still recognize, like Clive Bell, who was Vanessa, uh, Vanessa's husband, Ian Foster, Desmond McCarthy, and soon to be discussed more, Leonard Wolfe. Um, it was the place to be. It was the way to spread the word. It was just one of these galvanizing groups. They were all middle to upper class people, which is something in mind as well, for the most part. But just briefly, what happened to Virginia? So while losing her mother certainly had a very hard toll on Virginia's mind, according to her, it's not the full reason that she had a breakdown at the age of 13. She accused both of her half-brothers, Gerald and George, of sexually abusing her, both in her memoirs and in a 1920 speech. Her sister Vanessa was also a victim. But in her own day and in early biographies, these claims were dismissed. So what was happening at this point? The idea of a child being sexually abused was a, is a relatively new idea, unfortunately, in some cultures and in Victorian England. Generally, the thought was, if it did happen to you, it was a stranger. The idea that it happened within families was unthinkable. Girls were not believed if they reported anything, really, but particularly these kinds of things. So it was actually extremely bold of Virginia to be clear that these things had happened, um, most modern biographies seem inclined to believe her, especially considering how it seems to have impacted her life and her writing. But it's something to keep in mind. So when they were talking about being afraid that George would move in with them, I'm sure that was on their mind. Um, but because these accusations were ignored, Gerald and George continue to have a part in their life, unfortunately. So Bloomsbury to Fitzroy to Brunswick. They have another big blow. In 1906, Thobie dies. I mentioned that earlier. He does not make it um, past his late 20s. And then Vanessa, after turning him down twice, accepts Clive Bell's proposal of marriage on his third attempt. So this leaves Virginia and the now nearly grown Adrian, he's our future psychoanalyst, on their own. At this point, Adrian and Virginia are technically old enough to live on their own. Um, Vanessa and Virginia do stay close. They travel together, but by necessity, Virginia does get closer to Adrian. They continue the meetings that Phoebe and Virginia and Vanessa had set up. So Bloomsbury still meets often at their house. And when the lease is up, you know, they've moved to Fitzroy. When the lease is up, they move back to Bloomsbury onto Britain, the house on Brunswick. And they try a revolutionary housing experiment. Virginia lives alone on the top floor. Her brother lives on the floor below that. And then they have two male friends on the ground floor. So this was considered quite the scandalous situation for an unmarried woman. So on top of her questionable mental health, her lack of wealth, now she was also an unmarried woman who lived on a floor by herself. Very scandalous and not a very good uh, prospect for marriage, as you can imagine. But that does not stop Virginia. Leonard Wolfe is a friend of Thoby from Cambridge. And it's the way that most of the Bloomsbury group knew each other. So it's a little bit of an exclusive club. He became aware of Virginia in 1904, but it wasn't until he joined the living situation at Bushwick that he fell in love. And Leonard's an interesting character. He is born to a Jewish family in 1880, though he considers himself to be an atheist. He has a good showing at university, and he decides to take an exam for civil service. So at this point, he knows Virginia, but he's not close to her. He is appointed to modern-day Sri Lanka, and he works there for a while. He is put on leave for a year, and he lives in this Bushwick housing. He falls in love with Virginia, and he proposes, and she says, no, I'm not ready yet. So he quits his job <laughs> in the civil service so he can stick around to woo her and convince her, and it works. They get married in the summer of 1912, and Leonard doesn't have much money, which Virginia does lament, but she does seem to love him very much. Throughout their marriage, she has nothing but nice things to say about him, although we'll get to some of the things that are a little bit questionable, but for the most part, they seem to be happy together, although Leonard admitted to not knowing the depth of her struggles with mental health when they married. 
So let's talk about those. So when we talk about her having an issue after her mother died, it only increases over time. After her father's death, she has her first suicide attempt. She tries to jump out a window. It's not high enough to cause injury, and she was institutionalized afterwards. This is what Vanessa is inheriting as Stella gets married, is Virginia coming out of the institution. By the time the move to Bloomsbury is complete for the first time, she's able to return home. So Vanessa is managing a household with a very troubled younger lady under her care. So while the words used at the time were different, it seems like many members of the family suffered from episodes of depression and mania, including um, the departed Julia, who was said to be quite depressive, and her father, who was said to be, who suffered greatly from anxiety. Her second suicide attempt came shortly after her marriage. So this is when Leonard becomes aware of the depths of what she's struggling with. She attempted to poison herself, but luckily Leonard reacts really quickly and two uh, doctors are able to pump her stomach and save her life. But at the time when women acted this way, the recovery process was thought to be to essentially starve them of all intellectual pursuits. She wasn't supposed to read or write very much, and it would take a year before she was considered well enough to be returned to her usual habits. If you have any questions about that, there's a very famous short story called um, The Yellow Wallpaper, which I recommend reading. It's not Virginia, but it was so common that there was literature written about it at the time. She would be punctuated with these episodes for the rest of her life, um, often committed to an institution, or eventually Leonard starts to craft situations where she can be cared for at home, but she's essentially institutionalized at home on and off. So after this attempt, they move away from Bloomsbury. And they move around a couple of times, but they eventually settle at Garth House in 1915. Virginia had had a hobby since the early 1900s of bookbinding. And because they both were big writers and they both had a lot of ideals, they decided that they would form a press. And it was called Hogarth Press. And it still exists as an imprint of Penguin Random House today. And they were able to keep the overhead low in the beginning because it was just the two of them. They had a physical press that they ran out of the house. and. Um, was doable with just the two of them for some time. The press would go on to publish some of T.S. Eliot's work and other luminaries of the day. Most of Virginia's books were published that way, so as well as some of Leonard's work. They also did a lot of translations. Eventually, when they moved um, out of Hogarth House, it became bigger and they would hire apprentices and, and helpers with the press. Um, by the time it was sold to Random House in 1946, they had published 527 titles, so it was pretty successful. And Virginia saw the press as a way of giving a woman's place to vocalize their own views. It was really a room of one's own in that way. I want to take a pause here and talk about anti-Semitism. I really struggled to find ways to make this flow throughout the talk, but I don't want to ignore it um, because it is a very important thing to know about Virginia Woolf when you're considering the body of her work. So while she did write several short stories that touched on this and essays, it's not commonly seen in her more popular novels. So it's very easy to read her popular work and not be aware of her anti-Semitism. Um, so within the boundaries of her diaries, especially, you can find a lot of evidence of Virginia's profound hatred of Jews, her general classist beliefs, and a lot of intellectual snobbery. She did marry a Jewish man. And it did not seem to change her general feelings toward Jews at large. For a while, there was some thought that maybe with the onset of World War II, she had changed her mind, but her language doesn't change around the way she speaks about Jews at that time. So I don't believe that that's the case. She complains a length about her in-laws in particular. She uses a lot of stereotypes about Jews. And while she could well, she concludes herself that she's kind of snobby, that she sees things that way. She also never wrote about changing her mind. She is not alone. The Bloomsbury group in general, excepting Ian Foster, <laughs> were vocally anti-Semitic while also being loudly anti-fascist. And they refused to acknowledge how those things, two things interacted. In fact, one of the papers I read to try and prepare this slide because I wanted to give you as full of a view as I could, because obviously these things are often very highly debated. Um, there was some discussion that Wolf's language around Nazis was very similar to her language around Jews. And it's difficult to really say how she didn't see how those things interacted. 
In fact, she and Leonard wind up going on a car trip through Germany in the late 30s, where she jokes about having to disguise Leonard's Jewish features and does not seem to be disturbed by that. In fairness, Leonard doesn't really seem disturbed by it either. It's um, kind of a strange situation. But I just want to give you a full picture of the woman in question, and that is something that we can't ignore. There's a whole other interesting piece of her life and relatedly to that, um, but as also part of the Bloomsbury group was another very famous woman, in fact, more famous than Virginia at the time, Vita Saxville West. She's born in 1892. She was a shy and isolated child. She had an aristocratic father, but her mother had worked as a courtesan in Paris. Um, her parents separated while she was young, so she was raised by her mother. She did manage, though, to attend a fairly prestigious school where she started writing. It's, it, was a, it was a ladies' school, so prestigious for that, that quality of school, because ladies' schools were not as well-rounded as men's schools. Um, she did not consider herself as intellectual as her peers in the Bloomsbury group, even though she was one of the more beloved writers to come out of it. And she was definitely considered more accomplished by Virginia when Virginia passed away. Um, Virginia's prominence rose throughout the 20th century. Vita, from really early on, was having relationships with women. They're well documented. This is not a case where we're interpreting a historical record at a squint. She talked about it pretty extensively. We have it all written down. She did marry a man. She married a diplomat in 1913, but they had an open relationship with both of them pursuing same-sex relationships outside of marriage, which was not uncommon in the Bluesbury group. You were kind of encouraged to do it. They had a lot of libertine ideals, and everyone supposedly was quite comfortable with that. Um, the couple did have two children, Virginia and Vita meet in 1922. Their relationship reached its intimate peak between 1925 and 1928. They were definitely having an affair. Um, and that mellows into a friendship which lasts for the rest of Virginia's life. And Vita was probably one of her best correspondents as well. So during this period of heightened intimacy, Virginia writes three novels, one of which is Orlando, which is considered kind of like a love letter to Vita. She was trying to cheer Vita up. Ms. Vita was, should have in theory inherited her family estate. She was the only one capable, but because of the way it was entitled, it could not pass to a woman. So she lost her childhood home. She was very upset about. Um, and the book centers on a biographer, which Vita did some biographing. It was meant to satirize. We'll talk a little bit about it when we get there. Um, but one of the reasons that Virginia was probably extra productive wasn't always, wasn't just maybe being happy in this relationship, but because Vita was the first person to suggest, Hey, maybe when she's sad, don't take the things that she loves away from her. That's probably not helping. So Vita insisted that when Virginia was, um, suffering, that she should have more access to her books and be allowed to write as much as she liked. And it was during those periods that she was able to produce quite a lot of work. So we can probably thank Vita for that. So eventually we wind up at Monk House, um, which was meant to be a summer home. So all throughout Virginia's life, she would be live, she would have summer homes, both with her father and then eventually with Leonard. Monk House was the favorite. It's also where they wound up living full time after the Blitz destroyed their London house. So I thought we would just take a quick break to look around Monk House. Monk's house was a Monk's house was a primitive place when we arrived in 19... This is in Virginia's own words. On our first night here, the kitchen flooded. Mice scuttled over the beds. There was no hot water, no bath, and I wished we hadn't been forced to give up our lease at Asham. But over time it improved. I painted the walls green, blue and yellow, and my sister Nessa laughed at me for my poor taste but we filled the house with beautiful things that she and our friends made. Paintings and pottery and embroidered panels. When we could afford it, we added a new stove and extended the kitchen, which was a success, I think, but then I'm not a cook. Before long, we remembered what we had seen in the place. The unpretending house and the wild garden with its infinity of fruit-bearing trees and all enveloped by the South Downs. 
There is a quietness, a regularity to life at Monk's House that helps my mind to settle, as it never can whilst we're in London. The city perpetually attracts, stimulates, gives me a play and a story and a poem without any trouble. But when I'm not writing, or visiting, or being visited, Leonard and I keep ourselves busy running the Hogarth Press. But in Sussex, I often feel trance-like. The current of sensations and ideas, and the slow but fresh change of down, of road, of colour. All churned up into a fine sheet of perfect, calm happiness. So if you only knew that, you'd think she was living quite the high life. And it, that is an interesting dichotomy that you'll see with her writing on occasion, where she sounds quite happy. And she might have been. Um, it's not that she had one mood all the time. But by the sound of it, it sounds like Monk's House was a very peaceful retreat for her. Which brings us at last to her writing life. That's what she's known for, after all. Uh, and she was known primarily for this stream of consciousness this style that she was developing. I have the word alongside for a reason. Um, contemporaries like Proust. It was one of these zeitgeist moments where it's hard to say who started what, but it was certainly a trend that she helped begin um, this kind of beginning of modernism in writing. Um, she's 33 when her first novel was published, The Voyage Out, and it's published by Gerald's Press. So her brother is still lingering in her life. I'm sure that the starting of her own press had something to do with that. But um, the novel would be the start of a lot of themes that ran throughout her work, including the disconnection between thought, word, and action. So one of the things that she did not like about high society life was that people would act one way, think another, and do a third thing. And you'll see that throughout her writing where the character is thinking something deeply upsetting, but talking in very light ways if it doesn't matter to them. There would be two more of those kind of novels published under her half-brother's press, including Night and Day. And then we start getting into the meat of her productive fictional life. Mrs. Dalloway is the first of her books that's published by Hogarth Press. It's in 1925. Uh, if you haven't read it, it focuses on a woman who, like Virginia, is married and is in a certain set of society with some expectations on her. And she really is struggling with those expectations. It highlights mental health struggles, uh, all couched in Mrs. Dalloway going to buy some flowers. That's the opening line of the book. If you are familiar with the movie The Hours, it draws very heavily on Mrs. Dalloway and Virginia's life as major themes within the book. In the movie. In 1927, To the Lighthouse is published. It's another Heavily thematic book, it talks about struggling with the creative process, family tensions, and the effect of war on a nation. So in this case, she's still talking about the consequences of World War I, which obviously were quite profound on her family and her culture and her country. In 1928, we get Orlando, which is the book that's heavily influenced by Vita. Um, and it's meant to be satirical and to kind of poke fun at this kind of pompous academic tone that could happen in biographies. But Orlando is a really fascinating character because um, they are a person who lives as both genders. They're born female, experience a female life, and they're sort of immortal and just become a man at some point. So it's a really interesting exploration of gender at the time. I highly recommend it if you're curious about um, late Victorian, early Edwardian feelings on gender. It's kind of fascinating. There's two more novels in the 1930s, Flush, an autobiography, which is written from the perspective of a family dog. And The Years, which follows a family between 1890s to the 1930s. And The Years started out as a series of essays, which mutate into a novel when she couldn't make the essays flow the way that she wanted to. And then her final novel, Between the Acts, is published in 1941, just after her death. Many scholars consider it unfinished, though her husband in the forward um, claims that he, she would have found it complete. So Virginia wrote a ton more than the novels that she's famous for now. Um, lots of essays, biographies of other famous people, uh, particularly writers. And in the last decade of her life, she becomes even more political. She was already political, but very invested in speaking out against the abuse of women. Women's issues in particular were her main interest. She gave lectures and talks and wrote essays exhaustively on the subject. Um, and A Room of One's Own was a collection of four essays, 
And they really focus particularly on formal education and equal intellectual opportunities for women, getting women to be educated. And because of this kind of ascension that she had in that last decade, she's offered a lot of honors, you know, awards and um, society kind of things. And she refuses all of them. She states in her diary, it is an utterly corrupt society and I will take nothing that it can give me. She was not interested in being the token woman either. She felt oftentimes they were giving her this, and it may sound familiar even to our modern ears, where someone speaks out um, on how a certain minority is oppressed and they find themselves the sole minority person from that group who are acknowledged in the situation. Um, So she was trying to avoid that. After her death, Leonard does publish even more sets of her essays, a lot of them based on lectures that she had given. So we have a lot of those essays available to us. So probably the most famous thing, if you don't know much about Virginia Woolf, is her death. So let's talk about it. Um, She had these depressive episodes. And they were not uncommon when she finished a book, but before the book was released, she had a very common cycle where she would be anticipating reviews, anticipating reception, and she would become very, very depressed. So in 1940, she has just finished Between the Acts. And in September of 1940, the Wolf's London home is bombed in the Blitz. It's totally destroyed. And Virginia and Leonard were very aware that they in particular were in danger if England should fall to Germany, which at the time felt like a very real possibility. They were being bombed. Um, Leonard had devised two different plans for double suicide just in case this happened. And their fears were very real. They couldn't know it, but they were on Himmler's shortlist for arrest if London was captured. Not just because um, Leonard was Jewish, but because of the way they spoke out against fascism. So this all happens in 1940. In 1941, Virginia loses hope that anybody is listening to her at all about women's issues. She even becomes kind of convinced that maybe there's no hope in even bothering because women aren't capable of changing in the society that they're stuck in. So you can imagine, considering that's her life's work, she becomes extremely depressed. Um... There's some evidence that she attempted suicide a week before her actual death. Um, She returned home from a walk soaking wet and told Leonard that she'd fallen into a river. On March 28th, 1941, she fills her pockets with stones and she walks into the river. And that's her final suicide attempt. And it succeeds, unfortunately. She wrote a very short suicide note to her husband, which was described in several places I read as rational and clear. I don't really know why that matters, (laughs) but for some reason that seems to strike people. But she really mostly talked about how she was ending her life because she just felt it wasn't fair to her husband. Um, And her last few lines of writing were, if anybody could have saved me, it would have been you. Everything has gone for me, but the certainty of your goodness. I can't go on spoiling your life any longer. I don't think two people could have been happier than we have been. So she never wavers in saying how much she loves her husband. She does tease him a lot in her writing. She does make anti-Semitic remarks that are supposedly mutual jokes between them. Um, But she does seem to have been very dedicated to him nonetheless. So I will leave you to decide how you feel about their marriage. But Leonard stays dedicated to her and he does go on to publish all of her works so that she can continue to be known. Her ashes are interred under one of two elms. The boughs had interlaced. This was at at Monk House. The couple referred to the trees as Leonard and Virginia. When the trees died, her ashes are relocated under a bust with a plaque. The bust was made by one of the Bloomsbury artists in the 30s, so after the trees go, and you can see the bust here. There's the Statue of Virginia. Someone described it as a very sad bust. It is does look like one of her sadder, more dismal pictures it was modeled after, but she had a kind of a sad life, so maybe that's appropriate. Um, after her death, she is kind of a little bit forgotten about. Like I said, in her lifetime, Vita is by far the more celebrated writer. Leonard's work is fairly well known, especially you know the fact that he runs the press, and she's gone. And it's in the middle of World War II. 
so she's kind of forgotten for a while. However, she wrote a ton of essays on pacifism. And when the Vietnam War happens, coincidentally, her biography is published by her nephew, Quentin Bell. Like I said, she was quite close to her her nephews and stuff. And he wrote this book about her. And he said people became ravenously hungry for information about his aunt um, following the Vietnam War. And then as the women's rights movement moves forward um, in the 70s and 80s, there's even more resurgence with women seizing on Room of One's own essays and her books as um, calls to arms for women's rights. Um, so we started to see movies made of it, including a version of Mrs. Dalloway starring Vanessa Redgrave in 83, I believe. There is a lingering image of her as a flighty and frail woman who's prone to illness, um, her suicide, all of it kind of overshadows who she was as a person. And this seems to be a trend sometimes with female writers where the fact that they struggled and ultimately gave, you know, you know ended their lives becomes almost more important than the work itself. So if you do see the hours, it really focuses tightly on her struggles with mental illness and her death and does not focus on the fact that she created a tremendous body of work just hundreds of hey, hundreds and hundreds of pages of work. She was a diligent worker. She had a lot of ideas. And it also makes it muddy to analyze things like her anti-Semitism and her classism because people are so concerned about her mental health. I don't really know personally what to make of that, but that is her legacy. Um, I just wanted to go back. Jeff had asked, was Minnie related to the writer of Thackeray? She was. I, everybody's related to somebody famous in this, so I ran out of space. And I know Minnie only got one little line. So Minnie is Leslie's first wife, and she is the daughter of William Makepeace Thackeray. And he called her the balance wheel in the family, so she was quite important to him. So that answers your question, I hope. Jeff? So I, does anybody have any questions? Thanks everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye.